Welcome back. I'm Paul Gigo here on Potomac Watch with Alicia Finley and Bill McGurn. And Alicia, you heard Bill suggest that at least insofar as the presidential campaign is concerned, leave apart the courtroom implications. But as far as the presidential campaign, the documents cases are going to blur in the public mind and are probably not going to be all that important. What do you think? I happen to agree with him. And I think there are a lot of other in terms of the Trump cases, there are three or other cases. And I think these are all starting to blur in the public mind and they're starting to discredit them entirely. And I think that's one a problem for Joe Biden and Democrats, because I think the public hasn't really been paying close attention to these. They've seen Trump has been indicted again. And maybe there was a little bit of more resonance when the Biden, the transcript came out. And I think the Republicans charges that there may be a double standard. Whether or not that's true, I think that it's become more of a salient political point. And then then they'll hark back to Hillary Clinton and her server and all that. And I think that Trump is essentially being treated unfairly and that this is essentially a political vendetta against him. I think that that's really energizing the Republican voters. And I think that's why Trump, to be honest, won the Republican primary. Yeah, there's no question in my mind the evidence is clear from the polling movements that the various statements against Trump helped him get the nomination. On the other hand, the question is, well, now that it's a general campaign, if there were some kind of conviction, would one or another conviction hurt him? The documents case because of its complications, looks like it's going to be kicked past the election. That's probably the likeliest outcome. Judge Cannon could, of course, call a trial before then. We'll have to see. But if there's no trial until after, then this case, too, will not really have much of an impact. All right, let's turn to the second subject of the day, and that is this odd intervention by President Biden expressing publicly his concerns for the Nippon Steel proposal to buy U.S. steel. It's a $14 billion proposal. Nippon Steel is a highly efficient and important steel producer buying the venerable U.S. steel and promising to honor all labor agreements, promising to invest and improve the technology at uh, U.S. steel plants, which Nippon Steel is just a much better steel producer. So it could really improve the operations of U.S. steel. And yet President Biden came out and said the following. It is important that we maintain strong American steel companies powered by American steel workers. I told our steel workers, I have your backs. And I meant it. U.S. Steel has been an iconic American steel company for more than a century. And it is vital for it to remain an American steel company that is domestically owned and operated. And quote Alicia, is it really vital to have an American steel company that operates in the U.S. domestically owned? If it makes steel in the U.S.? I don't even think it's vital that they make steel in the U.S., but based on Biden and a lot of these industrial policy uh, proponents on the left and right, that is their stated goal is to increase steel production in the U.S. Even if you believe that, okay, okay, even if that's your belief that you must make steel in the United States, this would help that. Because they're coming in, they're saying we're going to do a $1.5 billion capital infusion, um, which would allow them to upgrade to the various plants to become more efficient. The issue here is that the U.S. steel workers in the Cleveland Cliffs, which is a major competitor, corporate competitor, corporate competitor have opposed the deal. And what's interesting here is the, one of the deals, there was a bidding war for U.S. steel last summer between Cleveland Cliffs and, and Nippon Steel. And Nippon Steel actually outbid them. But U.S. Steel also said that they didn't want to go with the Cleveland Cliffs offer because they were worried about antitrust concerns. And the combination between the two would basically give them... 65 to 90 percent market for the steel that is used in U.S. cars. Now, this is not the Nippon purchase. This, this would is, be this the would Cleveland, been the Cleveland Cliffs, Cliffs purchase which is of U.S. US steel, steel, which is right. Cleveland Cliffs being another U.S. company, which is unionized. And there is the key. Hold that thought. We're going to take another break and we'll come back more on the Nippon U.S. Steel and Broglio when we come back. Don't forget, you can reach the latest episode of Potomac Watch anytime. Just ask your smart speaker, play the opinion Potomac Watch podcast. That is, play the opinion Potomac Watch podcast. From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. I'm Paul Gigo here with Bill McGurn and Alicia Finley on Potomac Watch. We're talking about the rhetorical intervention by Joe Biden to attempt to interfere with the Nippon Steel proposal to buy U.S. steel. Alicia, why is the union 
question important here. Biden is very close to the union. He views the union support as critical for his reelection. We were talking about Cleveland Clips and space mainly in Ohio. And I don't think Ohio is really a swing state, but he's kind of fashioned this argument that he's very pro-worker, pro-working class. And here Trump has actually come out against the deal. The Nippon Steel purchase. Right. And then the two Pennsylvania senators, John Fetterman and Bob Casey, uh, as well as Sherrod Brown, have come out against it. And Sherrod Brown actually is at risk in this next election. He's Ohio Senator. Ohio, right. And he's up for re-election this year. So this is trying to outflank Donald Trump, I guess, on the protectionist front bill. But unlike uh, Trump's tariffs, which attempt to block foreign steel, this would attempt, if the purchase were blocked, blocking a foreign investment in U.S. steel production. It's very different. It's insane if you really care about workers. I think U.S. Steel is 27th largest steel producer in the world, and Nippon is fourth. So you have a very healthy company investing in less healthy company. Talk about workers. The studies show that American workers that are employed by foreign-owned companies in the same field generally make about 5% more than workers working for American companies. So this is just scare tactics. They look at it as a hostile act. Japan is a friendly country. We invest all over the place. Japan employs about 950,000 Americans in various industries across the board. It reminds me of, I think it was 89, when Mitsubishi was buying Rockefeller Center And there was all this hue and outcry. But American companies buy foreign companies overseas all the time. It would seem to me this is good news for U.S. Steel. Gives it a lease on life. At one time, they were the largest company in America, but not for a long time. Increasingly, they've been dependent on various prongs of industrial policy, protectionism, buy American, that sort of stuff. And it hasn't helped them. Plus, as Alicia points out, the union. And I think Nippon Steel is a way to make it competitive in the 21st century. And it's amazing that both parties seem to be opposed to this. Not yet. Elements of both parties, but now with, yeah, certainly they're leading the presidential candidates, but I guess that defines the party more than any other thing. Alicia, just a couple of points. One, there's some foreign policy implications for this in the sense that Bill says Japan's an ally of the United States and we want cross-Pacific trade with them. We want cross-Pacific investment with them. Heavily invested in both ways already. The president recently said he's going to postpone uh, approvals for liquefied natural gas export projects. Well, guess who's a big user of liquefied natural gas? <laughs> Japan. And we want to attempt to sell more liquefied national gas to Japan because it needs the energy. The president put that on hold. And those are long-term contracts when they're cut that sent a signal to the world that, hey, maybe the U.S. isn't a reliable provider. And now you have, oh, by the way, you also can't invest in American companies and manufacturing. I think the Japanese will react to this very badly. And I think they have some cause to do so. And it will be a very bad message for investors around the world about whether you can still invest in the United States without needless political interference. I think that's right. Uh, Japan is key ally. And I think this actually really undermines the Biden administration's you know, efforts to kind of strengthen the alliance to counter China. Yeah, this was supposed to be the administration that shored up alliance. alliances. Right. And actually, the other irony here is who really would benefit from this deal going down? And it's actually China in that, that the Chinese are the leading producers of steel. And to the extent that this makes U.S. steel more competitive. Now, I grant that U.S. steel production is somewhat protected by the 25% and tariffs. But Chinese are still the world's leading steel producers. And this would actually help China and maybe shore up its market share. And going back to the point of Japan, as you point out with the LNG, I had a meeting with the Japanese foreign ministry a year or so ago before it seemed Biden was even contemplating this pause on LNG experts. And they were very worried because they've paused and shut down a lot of their nuclear plants on the expectation that the American LNG will fill the supply gap. 
And now that a lot of these projects are not on hold, they're like, oh, well, what are we going to do? And it's likely what's going to happen is they're going to turn to coal. Then coal from China and coal from Indonesia. And how does that really help the climate? Or they cut a deal with LNG experts from Qatar or from Australia. So it's a puzzler. The other issue, Bill, is, as you point out, the workers. And my understanding here about Nippon Steel's promises is that they want to cut a deal with the United Steel workers. They want to honor the current collective bargaining agreement with the U.S. steel workers, and they'd be happy to cut a new deal. They could get the blessing of United Steel workers. Yeah, they want to be in the United States boosting U.S. Steel's production. That's why they're investing in it. And so I think if I were a worker there, I would say this is a good sign. Someone values us enough to invest in our company going forward to the future. So I don't really understand this. I think it's just another example of kind of cheap theatrics about standing up for workers when you're not really helping them. You're doing the opposite. All right, Bill. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. We're going to leave it at that for today. Today, we're here on Potomac Watch every day, so uh, please join us tomorrow, and in the future, we appreciate your listening.